Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Stress Related Gut Health Issues um, webinar. My name is Ben. I'm part of the Refer Engagement team at One Welbeck. Um, and I have tonight joining me Dr. Simon Peake, who's a consultant gastroenterologist with us at One Welbeck Digestive Health. Dr. Anna Wilson, consultant and gastroenterologist at One Welbeck Digestive Health as well. Um, Dr. Chris Rodkowski, consultant allergist at One Welbeck Skin Health and Allergy. And Miss Lucy Kerrison, who's a gut health uh, gut specialist dietitian at the Gut Health Clinic. Uh, they will be taking turns um, presenting today, starting with um, Dr. Simon Peak, who I will hand over now uh, for the first part of this presentation. Dr. Peak, all yours. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Simon Peak, and I'm uh, one of the gastroenterologists at One Wellbeck. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the subject of uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, something which I'm sure we all see uh, a lot of um, uh, and uh, a common uh, thing that walks into our clinic rooms. And I'm going to refer to these two uh, papers uh, which were published um, uh, fairly recently. The first is the NOICE guidance from February 2015, which is actually unusually for NOICE, quite a short, succinct guideline. Uh, which cl very clearly lays out the uh, diagnosis and management of irritable bowel syndrome and well worth a look at. The second paper was published last year in the, the Gut Journal, uh, and this uh, is, uh, was carried out by a working group of patients, clinicians, academics, dietitians, psychologists, uh, with the aim of summarising the latest evidence regarding uh, irritable bowel syndrome and providing a practical management framework. It's a very useful uh, uh, and interesting paper. So, as I said, we all see a lot of irritable bowel syndrome. It's a chronic relapsing, often lifelong disorder. It's essentially made up of three main uh, symptoms, uh, abdominal pain, altered bowel habits, and abdominal bloating. I'm not going to talk much about abdominal bloating during my presentation because Dr. Wilson's going to pick up on this a bit later on. The prevalence... The prevalence is somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. It depends which uh, criteria you uh, apply to it uh, and where you are, uh, but it is common and more common in women than men. Often affects younger people and the insulin is reduced with age and has a very large uh, economic cost, uh, both in terms of healthcare and also lost working days. Clearly, it can overlap with other conditions, which can sometimes make it difficult to uh, diagnose. So the Rome Foundation was uh, founded um, uh, about uh, three decades ago, yeah, in 1992, and it's an independent not-for-profit organisation with the aim of uh, uh, increasing uh, research uh, and assisting the diagnosis and treatment of functional bowel disorders, in particular irritable bowel syndrome. The first Rome criteria, the Rome 1 criteria, was published in 1992, and this has been updated four times since then. The latest room criteria, uh, which were published in 2016, slightly altered the definition or the requirements in order to have a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. And I've highlighted those changes there from the last set of criteria. Uh, and these more modern criteria reduce, if you apply them, they actually reduce the prevalence of Crohn's. It's a bit harder to, uh, for IBS, it's a bit harder to achieve that definition than the 2006 criteria. I think that the nice criteria uh, from 2015 give a much more pragmatic and possibly more useful definition for clinical practice of abdominal pain and discomfort over six months associated with some alteration of stool frequency and form and obviously the absence of alarm symptoms. There are different subtypes of irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, there's the constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome whereby 25% of bowel motions are bristol stool type one and two. Uh, and likewise, IBS with a diarrhea predominant component, uh, where 25% or more of the bowel motions will be type 6 or 7. Uh, there's a mixed picture and an unclassified picture. And I think it is useful to um, classify the type of IBS as it often uh, uh, helps with the treatment. Nobody really knows what causes uh, irritable bowel syndrome. It's probably uh, related to multiple different factors, and there's lots of research going into this at the moment. It's likely that individuals can be predisposed to developing irritable bowel syndrome by genetic um, uh, elements, infection or early adverse life events. And then on top of that, uh, issues such as chronic stress, psychological symptoms, uh, poor coping strategies, perhaps compound the problem. 
I'm not going to talk any more about the causes of IBS as it's poorly understood and there's lots of research going into it at the moment, but something that's worth looking, keeping an eye out for. What is, uh, what has become much clearer over the last uh, 10 years or so is the uh, importance of the gut-brain axis, and this was actually um, mentioned in the Rome 4 criteria. There's lots of uh, evidence in the papers looking at this. Uh, there's abnormalities in the gut-brain axis that have been picked up. Again, I'm not going to concentrate too much on this today, uh, but there are uh, definitely um, important uh, elements of this uh, which can be targeted with treatments, which we'll come on to shortly. How do you diagnose irritable bowel syndrome? Well, the NOICE guidelines suggest uh, that patients with primary care should have a full blood count, some inflammatory marker, whether that be CRP or ESR, uh, a negative c serology, cow protected in patients under the age of 45 with diarrhea, uh, and a CA125 in uh, females for ovarian uh, pathology. They list the following things as not being required to make the diagnosis. And I think this is perfectly reasonable, although clearly there are caveats to this. And this, uh, these criteria may not fit all patients. Some patients may require a few more tests in order to reassure ourselves that there's nothing else going on. Do they need a colonoscopy? Well, certainly if there's any red flag symptoms, uh, and also the possibility of microscopic colitis. And I've listed here some of the uh, uh, factors uh, that um, uh, might make one think about microscopic colitis, uh, age being female, watery diarrhea, medications that may cause it. CCAT scans for bile acid malabsorption, if there's atypical features, nocturnal diarrhea or a history of a cholecystectomy. Uh, and also worth uh, thinking about anorectal physiology uh, if it's a defecatory disorder or fecal incontinence, and that may help select those patients that may benefit from biofeedback as a treatment. The red flag symptoms I've lifted here, I think we all know these uh, very well. Uh, any of these would uh, prompt further investigations. So one uh, question is when do these patients get referred to secondary care or when should they be referred to secondary care? It's very clear that the vast majority of patients with IBS are managed in primary care I'm sure the uh, people listening to this presentation are well aware of that. Reasons to refer or consider a secondary care referral would be any alarm symptoms or signs that need further investigations, diagnostic uncertainty, uh, when you've tried first-line therapy and the symptoms are refractory to this, some therapies, second-line therapies that, uh, that aren't available in primary care, uh, and often uh, patients will request um, a, a second opinion or a further opinion, uh, to look at their symptoms. So I'm going to talk a bit about treatments of IBS. Um, I think first and foremost, it's really important to establish a, a good relationship with the patients. Um, taking an extra five or ten minutes during a consultation to listen and support and be empathetic makes a huge difference and has actually been shown to improve symptoms and quality of life, uh, improve adherence to treatment and reduce the number of healthcare visits. So this is clearly a very important uh, factor. The first treatment that uh, is always recommended is regular exercise. This is particularly important with uh, constipation predominant IBS, uh, but actually is important in any form of IBS, uh, whether that's due to uh, the exercise itself or whether that's due to better um, psychological health and endorphins is not clear, uh, but studies have shown the benefits of regular exercise can persist up to five years. I've put diet in here. I'm not going to talk about diet because Miss Kerrison is going to pick up on this later on and talk about it in much more detail, but this is where diet would fit in. So very early and very important for all patients. Probiotics. Uh, I often get asked about probiotics from uh, by patients with irritable bowel syndrome certainly may be effective for um, pain and bloating. There's no recommendation on which type of probiotic, uh, and the guidelines would suggest stopping it at 12 weeks if there's no improvements. After these measures have been uh, uh, addressed, the treatment then uh, is directed towards the predominant symptoms. So if we look at first line uh, drugs, and these are often started in primary care, uh, Smooth muscle relaxants, buscopanum and beverine, uh, very good for pain. Uh, peppermint oil, particularly good for bloating. 
Uh, for IBS with a diarrhea predominance, uh, no pyramides, uh, once we've ruled out any uh, organic pathology, uh, and polyethylene glycol for IBS uh, with a constipation predominance, uh, which is a, an osmotically active diarrhea, such as uh, osmotically active uh, laxative like um, Movacol, for example. Neuromodulators, certainly extremely effective, uh, act via the gut brain, the gut uh, brain axis. Uh, tricyclics, probably more effective than SSRIs. I think it's very important when starting or talking about these medications to explain the rationale to the patient, to talk about the gut brain axis, and that you're not giving this medication as an antidepressant, uh, but actually to try and modulate or reduce the, uh, the background noise coming up from the gut to the brain. Uh, I usually start amitriptyline at 10 milligrams uh, once a day. I tell them to take it at night before they go to bed uh, and then titrate the dose up to somewhere between 30 or even 50 milligrams a day. Moving on to second line drugs, uh, and these are things that we would start or consider in secondary care more likely. Uh, for diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome, phenylxadiline, uh, which acts on opioid receptors. Uh, this reduces uh, visceral hypersensitivity and slows gut transit. Uh, and the dose is uh, either 75 or 100 milligrams twice a day. There are other medications such as Lustron and Rivustron and Dancitron, uh, the latter of which we're probably uh, more familiar with. Uh, Alessatron uh, was um, withdrawn uh, about 20 years ago due to uh, episodes of ischemic colitis in the US uh, when it was used at a dose of one milligram twice a day. Uh, and subsequently, an FDA review found that a uh, half dose, so 0.5 milligrams twice a day, uh, was safe and effective uh, for people with severe uh, IBS uh, D, uh, and there were no adverse events when uh, this was used. Uh, so, this is a reasonable option. Rifaximin uh, is uh, unlicensed in the UK for this indication. Uh, it's been shown to have little effect on abdominal pain, but can be useful for diarrhea, even in those without evidence of SIBO uh, on, um, on uh, lactose breath tests. Um, the dose used uh, in this, these studies is 550 milligrams three times a day for two weeks. Uh, clearly, this is slightly restricted by cost often. Second line drugs for uh, constipation, predominant IBS. Uh, so secretagogs uh, do pretty much uh, what their name suggests. They activate ion channels on the intraluminal surface of enterocytes and release ions and water into the lumen. This has the effect of softening stool and accelerating transit through the gut. The uh, most used of these would be linaclotide or uh, constella, uh, which is guanate cyclase C agonist. Uh, the dose of this would be uh, 290 micrograms once a day, uh, and it's best to take about 30 minutes before breakfast. Some patients do experience side effects with this, such as nausea or diarrhea. Uh, and in these situations, I often ask them if they can to persist with the medication for a few more days, as often those side effects actually improve and resolve after a few days. Uh, if they still have problems after that, you can also take it every other day. Uh, in the US, they have a 145 microgram tablet, but unfortunately, that's not available uh, in the UK. Lubiprostone is a chloride channel activator. Lecanamide is also a guanylate cyclase C agonist, and it's an apple is a sodium hydrogen exchange inhibitor. And these are all other options. The 5-HT4 agonist, um, <clears throat> Tegesolod, is uh, not available in the UK. It's only available in the US. So after medication, <clears throat> there's the option of psychological therapy. Uh, the NICE guidance suggests that this should be considered uh, if first and second line therapies are ineffective in 12 months. But I think there are occasions with certain patients where you think it might be beneficial where you could consider it earlier if they're uh, receptive to the idea. The active and IPSOS studies were done uh, in 2019, and these are the largest uh, and most recent randomized controls uh, trials. Uh, there was a network meta-analysis done uh, two years ago, which included 10 randomized control trials and found that uh, psychological therapy was superior to controls, uh, quite significantly superior, uh, as well as minimal contact CBT, telephone-based CBD and group CBT. So it certainly appears to be quite an efficacious uh, treatment or intervention. Similarly, gut-directed hypnotherapy, uh, also effective uh, for the treatment of uh, IBS. 
<clears throat> refractory IBS, it's a bit of a difficult subject, I think, and there's no consensus definition. Um, I think when you see these patients, uh, it's important to ensure there hasn't been any pathology that's been missed um, from previous investigations, uh, bearing in mind there's a low yield from repeat investigations that have already been done. There are some other functional bowel disorders which I've listed there, uh, which uh, symptoms of which can overlap with IBS, so worth bearing in mind. But I think ultimately, uh, a multidisciplinary approach is probably the best way forward here. I've put in this treatment algorithm, which I think really nicely uh, uh, helps uh, with the management of irritable bowel syndrome. I'm not sure it projects particularly well, but this will be available on the YouTube channel uh, once this presentation is published. Uh, and just to end with, I was going to mention uh, fecal microbiota transplantation. Uh, I'm always surprised how many people actually mention this to me uh, in clinic uh, and are very receptive to the idea of uh, giving it a go. So there was a meta-analysis done uh, in 2019, uh, which looked at five randomized controlled trials for FMT in IBS, and this found no significant benefits uh, of uh, FMT compared to placebo. The studies, however, were criticized uh, for having small sample sizes and heterogeneity uh, with unstandardized data samples and poor study endpoints. So it's difficult to know what to make of this. However, uh, a year later, uh, this uh, paper was published in GUT. And I just thought I'd briefly mention the uh, outcomes of this. Uh, it's quite interesting. So this was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study of 165 patients, divided into three groups. One group was given placebo, one group was given 30 grams uh, FMT, and uh, one group 60 grams. Uh, and all the uh, stool samples were taken from one well-characterized donor and delivered uh, via a gastroscope. They looked at uh, the reduction of total IBS symptom score at three months and also secondary outcomes, change in bacterial profile and reduction in dysbiosis index. And the study actually achieved uh, quite statistically significantly the primary outcome. Uh, so 23.6% of the placebo group had a reduction of the uh, IBS scoring system, uh, but 77% uh, with the 30 grams uh, and almost 90% with the 60 grams. So certainly looked to be quite positive. In terms of secondary outcomes, there was a change in the bacterial profile, but not the dysbiosis index. But I think uh, when talking about FMT for IBS, I think the jury's still out. It's obviously not a treatment at the moment, uh, but maybe in the future. So just to uh, briefly summarize, um, we have to be careful not to over-diagnose IBS and medicalize patients. Uh, the latest criteria have been more specific than the previous set of criteria. Being empathetic during history taking is extremely important. Uh, not to over-investigate. I think there's a risk sometimes of doing more and more tests uh, and patients feeling that uh, we're just not finding the problem because we keep doing tests. So one has to, at some point, uh, stop uh, and try and manage the symptoms. Exercise and dietary changes are uh, always uh, worth considering before any medications. Uh, and don't forget uh, IBS-specific CBT. Uh, which looks to be quite a uh, promising treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. P, for that. Um, I will hand over to Dr. Wilson, who will um, carry on with the next presentation. Thank you, Ben. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Anna Wilson. I'm one of the consultant gastroenterologists. And um, today I will talk about my approach of abdominal bloating um, as distinct from irritable bowel syndrome and um, trying to stay away from some of the uh, things that um, Simon has already covered and really very typical of many of the patients that I tend to see in clinic. So I'm gonna start with a case which is very typical of a 33 year old lady who works in finance full time who presented with a five month history of bloating and abdominal distension. She reported little change in bowel habit although there's been a lifelong tendency to constipation and these symptoms of abdominal distension and bloating now started affecting her quality of life. There was no other relevant medical history or family history. She was on no regular medication or supplements, including not on any hormonal treatment. And she was non-smoker and she only uh, drank alcohol socially. So I suppose before we go any further, one of the main things that 
I think it's important to re-emphasize are the objective definitions of abdominal bloating and distension. So abdominal bloating is a subjective sensation of gasiness, trapped gas or feeling of pressure without any obvious distension. Whereas distension is an objective physical manifestation of an increase in abdominal girth. And quite often, I'm sure all of us will have patients who come into clinic and will say they feel like balloons or they feel like they are pregnant in terms due to their abdominal distension. Abdominal bloating and distension affect about 15 to 30 percent of population, but only half of the patients complain of both. So you can have bloating without any symptoms and any objective distension and vice versa. It's much commoner in women than men, and it tends to be typically common in women between about ages of 15 and 40. And the postmenopausally, the rate of these symptoms in women tends to approach that um, in men. So one of the main things that I try to approach when I see these patients is to try and understand if there is an organic pathology. And we, as ever, do that by careful history, examination, and then selective investigations. And one of the things that I try to emphasize and point that Dr. Peak has made earlier is about against over-medicalizing a lot of these patients, against having endless investigations, but trying to deal with the symptoms once we've excluded any significant pathology. In a 33-year-old lady, with no other history, with no risk factors, the pretest probability of there being an organic pathology is actually exceptionally low. But of course, patients do come with anxieties about what they've read. When we run the Bowel Cancer Screening Awareness Month, there are a number of patients who become more aware of it, become more anxious whether their symptoms represent that. And that's also important to address. So I tend to tailor investigations really on the basis of pretest probability and the history of the patient, as well as the examination. Most of the patients that I see, invariably some have had blood tests and some haven't, but I tend to do a basic blood test screen, full blood count with hematinics, celiac screen, thyroid function test. If they have any change in bowel habit, predominantly diarrhea, predominant bowel habit, I will do stool fecal calprotectin just to make sure that we're excluding an inflammatory condition. And of course, in all the patients, this will be different because you might be at that point considering doing a FIT or any other colonic investigation if there is a new change in bowel habit. But for a 33-year-old with no previous history and no new change in bowel habit, I wouldn't proceed in doing that. I often request abdominal ultrasound with very little evidence, and it's partly to reassure the patient. I, I think in my mind, what I talk to the patients about is that I want to know what is causing the obvious distension of bloating. Is it gas or fluid? Obviously, fluid is almost always organic pathology, and they will go down different investigations. And when I talk to the patients, and when I think about the gas, I tend to think, is there too much gas? Are the patients not expelling gas or having too much? So I think about any of the carbohydrate malabsorption problems, SIBO, patients with constipation or aerophagia inadvertently swallowing too much air. Or is there not an excess gas, but there is significant either visceral hypersensitivity or abnormal viscerosomatic reflexes in terms of patients diaphragm and abdominal wall muscle contract in relation to the elevated levels of gas. Because of course, the degree of bloating is common and normal to vast majority of us following carbohydrate laden meals, for example. What is not normal is for that sensation to carry on long term and have an effect on quality of life. So just to mention this lovely diagram about abnormal and normal viscerosomatic reflexes, as I say, when most of us feel normal, when we have a carbohydrate, particularly a laden meal, there's a degree of bloating. And what happens in that case is your diaphragm ascends upwards to, to free up more intra-abdominal space and your abdominal muscles contract. Whereas in patients who have abnormal viscerosomatic reflex, you have this relaxation of abdominal wall and therefore the distension the patient described together with pushing down of the diaphragm. <clears throat> 
So going back to the question, is there organic pathology or is it functional? I've simply here listed from a really helpful review published last year, the common causes of bloating and distension. And I suppose that the premise is that you're trying to exclude any organic or pathological causes. So things that we tend to often think about and we think about younger patients in particular are celiac disease um, and whether there are there is any change in hypo in a thyroid function test. So this is a sort of common thing that we think from gastrointestinal point of view. Of course, any previous surgery, abdominal problems, pancreatic insufficiency could also cause organic closes of bloating as can any carbohydrate intolerances or malabsorption and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then there is the the sort of functional bloating where we have patients with irritable bowel syndrome and uh, Dr. Peake has mentioned some of that, patients with chronic idiopathic constipation, pelvic floor dysfunction, functional dyspepsia and functional bloating, which are all distinct functional conditions. And this is the Rome criteria for definition of functional abdominal bloating and distension, which is fairly helpful in sort of trying to isolate these patients. Although, of course, management will be very similar across many of the different functional subgroups. So it's recurrent bloating and or distension occurring at least one day a week on average. And bloating and distension should be the predominant symptom. Patients shouldn't meet criteria for any of the functional disorders that we've mentioned already. And symptom onset should have occurred at least six months prior to diagnosis and with active symptoms in preceding three months. I'm sorry, this slide is not projecting particularly well, but the pathophysiology of bloating is quite interesting. I think it's fair to say that a bit like irritable bowel syndrome, we're not clear exactly what causes it. So we know there's relation between food and medication. We know that some patients have increased visceral hypertension hypersensitivity. Uh, We know there is a link between colonic dysbiosis as well as small bowel bacterial overgrowth, possibly related to altered intestinal motility, particularly in patients with no other risk factors for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and then pelvic floor dysfunction. But essentially, it's very difficult in an individual patient to try and pick a single etiology. It's usually the combination of factors that will lead to the symptoms. It's important to say that a number of patients may have these underlying pathologies, but are never presented with symptoms of bloating. One of the things that I have a particular interest in, and probably because my practice is skewed to a degree in that I have a large number of female patients who come and see me because I'm a female gastroenterologist, is the effect of female sex hormones on symptoms of bloating in particular, but also in general, the effect of sex hormone on gastrointestinal tract, which often is neglected. And I think really an issue in some women much more than the other. So some women, I think, are a lot more sensitive to the effect of female sex hormones than others. So we know the high dose of progesterone, for example, the late intestinal transit can lead to bloating, whereas the high doses of estrogen in particular lead to water retention, which is, of course, another cause of bloating. When we think about the luteal, so post-ovulation phase, when we have particularly the late luteal phase, when we have a drop of both progesterone and estrogen, that's often when the patients get actually the greatest degree of bloating. So the pre-menstruation is when patients often describe greatest degree of bloating, which actually in some patients corresponds to increasing diarrhea or fast intestinal motility as the level of progesterone falls. An important thing also to note is that there is very good data to show that during menstrual period, a pain threshold, female pain threshold, is significantly low. And that's also thought to be mediated to a degree by the lower levels of estrogen and progesterone. Because we know that higher levels of estrogen, of course, do have uh, effects, stimulating effects on serotonin, which will dampen down the pain response. So it's quite important to take lots of this in account. And of course, this partly explains why some of the perimenopausal symptoms include bloating to a degree and sometimes a change in bowel habit, because it's a huge fluctuation of hormones. And towards the end of the perimenopausal period, decrease in hormones that will have a significant effect on the gut motility and therefore the symptoms the patients experience. I've just added a slide here because I anticipated some questions about um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So the 
patient that I'd mentioned in clinic had completely normal tests with normal blood tests, negative celiac screen, normal thyroid function test, normal ultrasound. And the question is, would one routinely request either a lactulose breath test, hydrogen methane breath test for look for SIBO? And would you go down the line then of requesting the specific carbohydrate lactose and fructose intolerance test in order to try and work out whether the patient is intolerant to those? And I'm sure Dr. Rutkowski will cover this in a bit more detail. So what is my approach to this? Um, patients are very aware of SIBO at the moment. I think it's popularized in the press. There are low SIBO diets. They're interested in treatments. So although for many years I have spent uh, explaining to patients that it's very unlikely for young, healthy patients without pre-existing conditions, so either specific structural abnormalities, such as blind loops, previous gastrointestinal surgery, pelvic radiotherapy, or the conditions that affect gastrointestinal motility, such as diabetes, amyloidosis, it would be very unrare for patients to develop SIBO. Nevertheless, over the years, there have been few patients who have tested positive for hydrogen and methane on the breath test and have come back asking for treatment. And again, I go back to the, the treatment of choice being rifaximin, which of course is an issue because even though it's slightly cheaper now, it still presents prescribing problems, particularly because similarly the dose is 550 milligrams three times a day, either for 10 or 14 days. And the reason why SIBO tests are difficult to interpret is that they are based on normal uh, average or sequel time. And of course, we know the patient's gastrointestinal motility and small bowel motility differs. Nevertheless, I think if the patients are very keen or come back having had a positive SIBO result, I often find it, frankly, easier to manage by giving them a course of rifaximin, which is not absorbable antibiotic, and therefore will have minimal side effects on the extra gut uh, uh, systems and therefore trying to see whether they get response to it or not. In terms of management, I think for lots of these patients, reassurance is really important. Reassurance that they are not the only patients, reassurance that there's nothing significant going on and explanation of, of sort of what is a normal and what is abnormal symptomatology. Diet, I do think, plays a key role, but I think it needs to be under careful supervision of dietitian. And Lucy, I'm sure, will cover this in a bit more detail, so I won't go on that. But there are numerous aspects in a diet that we tend to use in managing these patients, including putting them on a low FODMAP diet, etc. The bloating per se, as, as symbol, the, the management of bloating, lots of the uh, management strategies are extrapolated from treating IBS. So they don't all necessarily work for bloating as well. But we know that in a number of patients, antispasmodics -spasmo work. So mebeverin, uh, peppermint oil, bascopan. Um, there is a bit of evidence for probiotics. But in terms of bloating, the only ones that are uh, evidence-based to work are those containing bifidobacterium bacteria, so Optibac or Biocold. We know that exercise is really important in managing these patients. So, and that is sort of gentle and frequent exercises. And we're talking walking, yoga, Pilates. And there is quite good data to show that this abdominal distension reduces following exercise. Brain-gut axis is something that's really important, and we know that stress affects this. Quite a lot of these patients are incredibly stressed. They live very busy lives. They have jobs which are incredibly demanding. Often young families, this patient was getting married. So there are external factors that contribute to this. It's very difficult to uh, deal with those with the patients without any sort of professional support, but there are a number of apps out there which actually patients find very useful. Headspace, Calm, most people, have a busy they are, you can tell them they can listen to the app while they're on a tube or while they're driving, and they, they, they sort of tend to listen to that. Again, visceral hypersensitivity, I tend to reach for drugs really late in this patient group, but it's sometimes necessary. Sometimes you've tried absolutely everything 
and you're not helping situation. Again, my drug of choice is tricyclic antidepressant. I tend to use nortriptyline as the first line because I think it has a few side effects than amitriptyline. But again, I start with 10 milligrams at night and very rarely have to go to higher doses, I have to say. I do use higher doses for patients when neuropathic pain is an issue, but really for visual hypersensitivity, I find 10 milligrams a night is often sufficient. So Talopram and Isitalopram obviously also have very good data as well for sensations of bloating. Biofeedback is really important for patients with any pelvic floor dysfunction, but also in terms of general approach to the patients and pelvic floor physiotherapy, they do sometimes focus on abdominal visceral reflexes and it tends to be really helpful in this patient group. So coming back to my patients, all her investigations were normal, including negative breath test, which we did just to satisfy uh, so that she feels that we, we've done everything. Um, she went up to see a dietitian and actually tried some probiotics and did try and introduce some exercise, which for her involved getting off a tube a bit earlier and walking both on the way home and the way to work. And she is left with still occasional episodes of bloating but it's not worried about it and it's not affecting her quality of life. And I think that's what we aim to reach with lots of these patients. We're not trying to get rid of the symptom completely, but we're trying to reach a stage where it's not affecting their personal quality of life and helping them achieve what, what they want to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. I will swiftly hand over to Dr. Rakowski, who will run us through uh, the allergy side of things. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, now I'm going to talk about food and food intolerance and allergy from the allergist's point of view. So uh, food might take your patient to see a gastroenterologist or an allergist, depending what symptoms patients uh, present with. And I think the most important thing is to try to distinguish between what we in the allergy world understand as food allergy and what we understand to represent food intolerance. So I'm trying to advance my slides, and here they are. So food intolerance, this is a non-immunological response to food at a dose that is usually tolerated. And uh, food intolerances, they are a very significant part of adverse reactions to food. And depending on what data you refer to, up to 20% of patients will report a food intolerance. Food allergy, on the other hand, it's an abnormal response to food. Our immune system is involved. There are different mechanisms. And again, depending on data, it can be up to 2% of adults. And as we all know, it's far more common in kids and it can affect up to 10% of kids. It's important to distinguish between different types of adverse reactions to food. So we have the reactions that are immunologically mediated. So that's your food allergy, that's celiac disease. And of, of course, there are also reactions where the mechanism is either not understood or definitely it is considered to be non-immunological. And that's, for example, enzymatic defects, for example, lactose intolerance, and we're gonna again talk about it in a second. Everyone knows that food allergy can cause different symptoms. They can involve your skin, they can make you come up in hives, you can have breathlessness, you can feel dizzy, you can collapse, there can be vomiting, diarrhea, there can be some other symptoms, including fatal anaphylaxis, and the reaction to food that uh, occurs in the, the allergic mechanism is usually very, very rapid, but definitely within maximum two hours. So that's, if your patient reports a systemic presentation to food, then food allergy is more likely than food intolerance. And there are lots of different tests that we can do for food allergy. Everyone is familiar with specific IgE testing. We have more sophisticated allergy tests that allow us to predict risk of severe reaction to food. We have more sophisticated laboratory methods that are currently used mainly in the research setting, such as basophil activation tests. And of course, if I see a patient in clinic, I can perform skin prick tests. I can perform a challenge if there, is a, if there are doubts whether the patient is allergic or not. But what's very important that there is unfortunately, or there are unfortunately no evidence-based tests for food intolerances, except enzymatic deficiencies. And many patients that you see in clinic, many patients who come to see me, they bring a long list of results, so-called York tests, where IgG is tested. And IgG, or immunoglobulin G response to food, has nothing to do with food intolerance, has nothing to do with food allergy. And un unfortunately, this is not going to be a very helpful test. If your patient is concerned about reactions to food, 
the right people to talk to would be a gastroenterologist, a dietitian, an allergist, but not necessarily spending money on an IgG test. So lots of good quality evidence-based tests for food allergy, but not no real tests for food intolerances. And I think there are certain types of food allergy and food intolerances that often get mixed up. And your patients might ask you, doctor, am I allergic to milk or do I have lactose intolerance? And if you look at this slide, I know there is lots of information here, but if you look at the cow's milk allergy section of the slide, it is a reaction where specific Ig plays an important role. That's why you can test using skin prick testing or blood testing. The reactions are very common in children. The reactions can be life-threatening. And actually, milk allergy is one of the most common causes of fatal anaphylaxis in children, not necessarily peanuts that everyone is talking about. The presentation can be very different. There are lots of evidence-based testing methods. But the good thing is that there is a high chance that your patient will grow out of milk allergy. Milk allergy that causes systemic symptoms, the skin, the gut, the breathing. Whereas if your patient is lactose intolerant, if we ignore for a second the congenital lact lactase deficiency, usually symptoms start later in life. Patients often present with mainly gastrointestinal symptoms, and there are different, including abdominal distension and bloating and constipation, and they usually react to quite a significant amount of lactose. So the mechanism is completely different. If you are milk allergic, you react to milk proteins. If you are lactose intolerant, your body is unable to process, digest the so-called milk sugar or the carbohydrate in milk. So the mechanism is different, the presentation is different. But unfortunately, if you have secondary lactose deficiency, it might not resolve. So you might have to learn to live with it. Cow's milk allergy can be life-threatening. Lactose intolerance is never life-threatening. Both can have a significant impact on our patient's quality of life, but the consequences of non-adherence to diet are slightly different. And why are we lactose intolerant? This is because many patients have the so-called lactase enzyme deficiency. It can be congenital, so that's where kids are born with no activity of the enzyme or very, very minimal activity. This is a very rare autosomal recessive disease. It could be primary or the so-called adult type lactase deficiency, which is very common. And gradually, as we get older, for different reasons, including genetic reasons, the gene for lactase is, less, is expressed to a lesser degree, and patients start to experience symptoms of lactose intolerant, intolerance. But it's also important to remember that there can be secondary lactase deficiency if patients have a condition that affects their gut. And as the condition improves, their lactase deficiency or lactose intolerance should improve as well. And we need to remember that milk allergy can cause different problems. You can have severe life-threatening reactions, the so-called anaphylactic reactions, or you can have damage to the gut, which will cause secondary lactase deficiency. So your patient might be experiencing two types of symptoms, but the mechanism is different. The culprit is the same. Milk can lead to two different types of presentation, but treatment and prognosis will be slightly different. There are different tests, which are usually performed by our gastroenterology colleagues. And everyone is familiar with the hydrogen breath test. But there are also other tests, such as lactose tolerance tests. There are genetic tests. There are tests that can be performed only during, during an uh, endoscopic investigation. What matters is, with all symptoms, especially in the allergy clinic, is to take a very detailed history. Because sometimes tests might not be needed, and the diagnosis might be clinical. Another thing that many patients report is wheat allergy. These days, most people report some kind of food intolerance, but they often mix it up with allergy. So I would like to make it very clear what the difference is between wheat allergy, wheat intolerance, and celiac disease. So gluten is present in different grains. There are different gluten-related disorders. So you have your gluten or wheat allergy, you have celiac disease, you have different skin symptoms that can accompany celiac disease, and there are also some neurological symptoms that are thought to be provoked by gluten. But the condition that most of us are familiar with for the celiac disease, it's a genetically driven reaction, damage to the small bowel that is precipitated by gluten. And gluten uh, can cause different presentation in celiac disease. You have the classical presentation where patients have diarrhea, weight loss, failure to grow, 
But there are also some patients who present with uh, symptoms that are slightly less uh, clear. And as Dr. Wilson and Dr. Peake men mentioned, celiac disease testing is part of, part of the, the testing uh, series in patients with uh, unexplained bowel symptoms, with IBS, with bloating. And what's quite interesting that there are three main categories of, uh, of uh, symptoms in celiac disease. And as you can see, patients who present with the sort of classic symptoms are in the minority. And usually around 50% of patients will present with symptoms that are slightly different. So it's always important to have a high level of clinical suspicion, perform the right test at the right moment. I'm not going to talk about testing, but we know that, for example, if you want to do serological tests, your patients should be eating gluten. Otherwise, there is no point in sending off uh, antibody tests. But always remember that there might be symptoms that are not 100% convincing, yet if you perform the relevant tests, you might di uh, diagnose your patient with celiac disease. One thing that uh, comes up in allergy clinics quite a lot are patients who say that they don't have celiac disease, but they have what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So these are patients who have IBS-like symptoms, but they also report symptoms that are not in their gut. So they sometimes complain of headaches or feeling generally unwell. And they report that their symptoms improve very quickly as soon as they stop gluten, but symptoms come back when they start eating gluten again. And it's very important that before we say that you have gluten intolerance, because that's essentially what it is, that we have ruled out celiac disease and we have ruled out wheat allergy. So that's, as I said, this is exactly the reason, as I said, why some patients might see a gastroenterologist first, some patients might see an allergist first, but it's crucial to exclude these two conditions before we say to our patient that gluten intolerance or wheat intolerance is quite likely. And this is a very useful, very busy, but a very useful slide. And if we look at it from the end, so wheat allergy, driven by wheat proteins. It's usually driven by immunoglobulin E. The reactions can be life-threatening. We see it in children, we see it in adults with life-threatening, potentially fatal anaphylaxis. Tiny quantity can cause a reaction that can present as anaphylaxis. And we can test using skin testing, blood testing, provocation testing. These patients must remain wheat-free. Exposure even to the smallest quantity of wheat can be life-threatening. But again, there is a chance that they might grow out of their wheat allergy. Patients with celiac disease uh, have symptoms that are driven by gluten, and uh, there are genetic tests, there are serological tests. They have to obviously remain gluten-free, and the condition is lifelong. Usually, it's not going to resolve. Whereas patients with the so-called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, the exact mechanism is not clear. The prevalence can be very high, depending on what what uh, paper, what epidemiological data we refer to, up to 15% of patients can report gluten intolerance or sensitivity. It's a condition that is poorly understood. This condition is clearly related to wheat and it improves when wheat or gluten is excluded, but we don't know whether it is going to last lifelong or whether it's going to resolve. It's quite a recent, recently described condition, but it always has to be thought about in the same context as wheat allergy and celiac disease, we have to exclude these two conditions before we can start thinking about wheat intolerance. And I think this, those were the sort of two most important types of food allergy and food intolerance, wheat allergy, celiac disease, and wheat intolerance, and cow's milk allergy and lactose intolerance. There are many tests that can be performed in the community in the primary care setting. But of course, if your patients are stuck and you don't know where they should be going with these symptoms, please talk to, to an allergist, please talk to a dermat, please talk to a gastroenterologist, and we'll be delighted to help. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague Lucina. Some really interesting talks so far. So thanks for joining. I'm Lucy. I'm one of the gut health specialist dietitians at the Gut Health Clinic. So we have a team of eight dietitians now and we work at One Well Back and also um, we complete consultations via Zoom as well. So my talk today, it's going to be about 10 minutes and it's going to go over the dietary treatment of IBS. So we know, as you've seen from all my colleagues, the kind of holistic treatment is really, really important. But what I'm going to hone in on today is the diet side. And so... To make it really useful, I know there's a few GPs watching, I want to cover dietary therapies for IBS, including what can be done without a dietitian, because 
we know the prevalence of IBS is so high and of dietitians, we don't have enough. There's not enough of us. So what can you do without us? as well as some really useful resources that you can guide your patients towards, and then when to refer on to a dietitian for a little bit more specific input. So my first slide here, I'm not sure if you can see quite to the end of our names, um, but this is from the British Dietetic Association. So it's some of our, our guidelines in terms of treatments and methods. And so what I want to focus on really are the first line treatments so in that first box under IBS diagnosis. And we know that actually all of these first line treatments can be undertaken without the help of a dietitian. And actually, I think they can sometimes be slightly overlooked because it's around 50% of patients with IBS symptoms can see some really significant improvements just with these first line treatments. And so in terms of resources, the BDA is a really great resource. Um, so they've got a whole range of food fact sheets that you can share with your patients on IBS and other conditions. And also there's some NHS webinars designed by dietitians for things like first line advice you can direct your patients towards as well. So this has been taken from the BDA food fact sheet on IBS. There's a couple extra sections as well. But this is the first bit I wanted to touch on. And this is really a bit of a general overview in terms of um, changes that the patient can make by themselves to help improve symptoms. So some of these are quite simple and it's um, really ensuring they're having a healthy, a regular meal pattern, which again, it sounds so simple, but so important. Um, and I think, you know, as my, my colleagues have all mentioned as well, what's really important in IBS is that we're a little bit more specific to their type of IBS and to their symptoms in order to help them the most. So this will give a bit of a general overview. And coming up next, we have some more kind of specific um, advice in relation to symptoms. <clears throat> so again, from the same food fact sheet, these are all things that you can advise your patients on. And I would recommend patients when they make these changes to be really consistent with them for at least four weeks before they kind of monitor and decide whether it's working for them or not. So we see lots of patients in clinic who have maybe tried a few changes for a couple of weeks at a time, felt it wasn't really helping them and then stopped there. And I think particularly patients of IBSC or constipation predominant, it can really take that time to um, allow their gut to adapt to the changes, especially when we're looking at, as you can see here in the middle, um, things like fiber increases. And so one of the most important things or first line techniques for IBSC would be looking at increasing specific fibers in the diet. Um, so we shouldn't really refer them to um, as soluble and insoluble, but kind of the ease <laughs> is a little bit easier. Um, so things like linseeds, flax seeds, chia seeds, they all form a gel in the bowel. And so these can be reintroduced really easily. So beginning with about a teaspoon or a tablespoon per day and slowly building that up. So I usually recommend building up by about one tablespoon per week. So you might start with a, a tablespoon per day for a week, then week two, go up to two tablespoons per day. And some patients will go a little bit higher as well. There's equally some really great fibers to help with IBSD in things like kiwi fruits. So there's quite a few studies on these now. These have a bit of an osmotic effect in the bowel and tend to be really well tolerated as well. So it's a really nice, easy inclusion that clients can look at or patients. In terms of wind and bloating, as you can see above, so this is one of our primary complaints that we see. So I think it's around 80% of patients of IBS tend to have bloating as well. And so what I like to hone in on here is really where that bloating is. So if it's kind of higher up bloating, you know, just under the rib cage, perhaps um, around the stomach area, then the patient is, it's worth focusing on things like meal size, meal timings, the speed of eating and chewing their food, because actually it sounds like the, the bloating is kind of more in the stomach area and potentially stress as well is a little bit more indicated in that upper bloating. The lower bloating or kind of mid bloating could be a combination of things, could be more FODMAPs that we'll get onto as well. And so with a lot of these techniques that you can see here, I think the key thing when we're looking at reduction of foods is to reduce rather than completely exclude initially. Um, so things like beans and pulses, they can be quite gaseous. A lot of us will get a bit bloated with those. Um, as Anna was mentioning, it's looking at 
symptom improvement rather than micromanaging symptoms and kind of looking out for every little sign of bloating, etc. So lastly, here on um, in terms of diarrhea, looser stools, it's looking at reducing those higher fibre foods um, and also concentrating on things like artificial sweeteners. And I think, again, what we tend to see is Clients will come in and they may have gone through Weight Watchers or weight loss programs, Slimming World. And so to lose weight, they're using all these artificial sweeteners. And actually, in terms of their gut and symptoms, that can be quite difficult to tolerate. So things like chewing gums, Diet Cokes um, and other sweetened foods, so low fat yogurts, etc. What you can also do with some of these clients um, in terms of first line and before you see a dietitian is to look at a, a four week reduction of either lactose or fructose, which again are quite common culprits in IBS. And what's really important if a patient does do either of these is that it is for four weeks, but it's also then tested. So we want to make sure the exclusion has shown symptom improvements and then we test to check that it's actually that product which is causing them a difficulty. And so if we were looking at fructose, it's primarily in your fruits, your fruit syrups, and also added to processed products like biscuits and cereals sometimes as well. So in terms of a fructose reduction rather than complete exclusion, I tend to advise a max three fresh portions of fruit split throughout the day, being careful with concentration, so fruit juices, smoothies, and looking at the labels for those four weeks. When we're looking at lactose, so this is present in the non-fat component of dairy, so it's in milk, yogurt, and only some cheeses. So it tends to be your fresh, less well-aged cheeses like cottage, quark, uh, ricotta, halloumi are higher in lactose, whereas actually your brie, feta, uh, cheddar, mozzarella, a lot of your hard and soft cheeses, because they've been fermented, are lower in lactose. And I think often patients on their own will try to exclude all dairy when actually it might not be necessary. And I think what's also really key for patients doing a lactose reduction is to look at lactose free products as well as the kind of the nut based etc alternatives because there are a lot of products so the lactose free milk for example they pop in the enzyme the lactase enzyme to digest fat sugar so the rest of the milk is nutritionally equal to your your lactose containing milk which is a little bit better than some of the alternatives and a little bit better or easier in terms of your calcium levels as well because if you are doing a lactose reduction then Again, we're putting the patient at a slight risk of uh, lower calcium levels, uh, potentially brittle bones, etc. And actually, we do know this is quite a young cohort. And depending on genetics, you can still be building your peak bone mass until about 30 years old. So we don't want to be putting anyone um, at a disadvantage there. So if you are looking at the lactose side with your patients, I would definitely, definitely concentrate on calcium. Make sure they're either using the lactose free products, fortified alternatives. Um, and I would also guide them towards the BDA, British Dietetic Association, food fact sheet on calcium, which is really helpful. So these are some of the things that you can do um, yourselves with patients. Um, and then in terms of dietetic referrals, this tends to be for more specific or, or guided advice around eliminations, um, et cetera. So we accept referrals at any stage in the pathway, so pre, during or post diagnosis. Um, if we do accept someone pre or during diagnosis, then you know, we'd be screening and making sure that they've, they've had for relevant tests that have already been spoken about today and that actually what we are treating is IBS and we're not masking any other condition with dietary changes. So if first line techniques, as I've described, some of don't work, then the low FODMAP diet can be really effective in about 75% of patients. And actually this stat a lot of the time comes from patients who have been guided by a dietitian. And we know that if a patient tries to follow this diet on their own, first of all, it can be really tricky. It's really restrictive, but they're also at high risk of deficiency of a whole range of nutrients. So you know, calcium, fiber, your folate, your iron levels or at higher risk if you're following this diet. And so what's really important with the low FODMAP diet as well is, again, looking at symptoms modifying it to suit the patient and also making sure we go through the full three phases 
Because what we tend to find again is some patients will come to us and they'll have read into the low fod map diet or be following it, and they'll be restricting for months on end or even years and not even realize there's a second and a third phase. And we know that as well as those nutritional deficiencies, if you're following a low FODMAP diet, then you're at risk of dysbiosis or a negative change in your gut bacteria, which is linked with all sorts of areas of health. So all of your high FODMAP foods are prebiotic. So they're feeding the probiotics of the bacteria in your gut. So we just want to make sure this first restrictive phase is only temporary and only as restrictive as it needs to be. So the first phase tends to be two to six weeks. Sometimes you might do a little bit longer, maybe up to eight weeks. And we'd then see the patient again, ensure they've had good symptom relief before looking at the reintroduction phase where we test different FODMAP groups. Because it's likely that there's just some of these FODMAP groups that the patient is more sensitive to, these FODMAP sugars. And so in the long term, we want to bring in back as many as we can so that actually the patient isn't following a long term restrictive diet. So they're not having the, you know, the ongoing negative changes in their gut bacteria. So with the low FODMAP diets in practice, a gastrointestinal dietitian will assess current intake, first of all, of FODMAPs. And we might recommend, as I say, a full or a modified low FODMAP diet. So with many of our patients, we look at things like a FODMAP light approach. So we're just reducing some of the main high FODMAP foods. And that can be really, really effective and slightly easier to follow. And actually, it's a better approach if a patient can adhere to it well for those, say, four weeks, rather than being very strict for two weeks, and not managing to follow the plan or see symptom improves. Um, and so some of these high FODMAP foods as well, I would actually increase in certain cases with patients with IBS. So we know that all of these fibres, all of these FODMAPs, which your lower gut, your colon, whether fermented uh, by bacteria producing gas and some of these uh, changes in stools. Some of your FODMAP groups, so your fructose and your polyols, your sorbitol, your mannitol, these can draw water into the gut and actually act as a bit of a natural laxative for those who have IBSC. So in some cases, I might increase those or dietitians might increase those in patients with IBSC. Another really, really key thing in terms of the low FODMAP diet is we want to be screening for eating disorders, um, which a lot of dietitians and definitely gut specialist dietitians can do, because if someone has and maybe not just an eating disorder, but disordered eating or a poor relationship with food, we don't want to damage that further by putting them on a prolonged exclusion diet. And so we would always approach this holistically, as I mentioned, so dietary techniques in combination with the non-dietary approaches for the best results for the patient. So I've got a bit of a summary in terms of uh, the dietitian here. You can see in the middle and a few little bubbles coming out uh, in terms of what we look for and how we would treat um, one of your patients. And so as I mentioned at the start, we're a team of eight gut specialist guide dietitians. So we work with patients who have IBS, IBD, celiac disease, uh, liver disease. We have also brought on a, a weight management dietitian um, and we accept either self-referrals, consultant referrals, GP referrals, or HCP referrals. So this can be via our website, so www.guthealthclinic.com, or via email, so bookings at theguthealthclinic.com too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Kepson. That was very instructive. Um, shall we move on to the um, question and answers? Uh, we actually have one question from um, John Rees. Um, Chris, I think this would be for you. Uh, so if someone tested negatively age 20 for celiac, um, is there any repeating the test in their 40s? Um, can you develop celiac later in life or is it only necessary to do one test in a lifetime? It's a, it's a very interesting question because it, it sort of, uh, there's an overlap between allergy and uh, gastroenterology and it depends what symptoms this patient presents with. But uh, I think sometimes we might have to be guided by the presentation and also for reassurance, we might have to do it. But I think I would ask my gastroenterology colleagues as well to comment what their approach would be because this group of patients might actually see them first before they see me. So Anna and Simon, what, what, do, you, what do you think? So I think the question was, if, if they've tested negative at the age of 20, is it is it reasonable to test them at the age of 40 with the new symptoms? And I think the answer is yes, because patients can develop celiac disease. We don't quite know what the exact trigger is 
for the clinical presentation. But we've certainly seen that, that we've had patients obviously who have tested negative for, for some time for looking, because you're just testing for DTG. But we've certainly seen that trigger, environmental trigger and triggering the clinical presentation can happen late in life. So sadly, if the patients present with vague GI symptoms, then I would test them again. Um, Simon, I wonder what your thoughts would be. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. It can present at any age, and uh, one negative test early in your life doesn't preclude it from happening later. Uh, it's obviously a very easy test to do as well. Thank you very much for that, doctors. Um, we also have um, Dr. Lisa Das who joined us um, midway. Um, Dr. Lisa Das is also a gastroenterologist at One World Digestive Health. Um, she's recently released a book called Managing IBS. Um, so please do go and um, look it up. Um, very interesting read. We can also answer your questions um, after this webinar has ended. If you want to send your inquiries to gpinquiries at onewellbeck.com, uh, we're happy to forward them to our experts and obviously come back to you. Um, and it is always a pleasure to hear from um, all of our referrers. Doctors, anything to add on um, any of this? I'd just like to say uh, a big thank you to all my colleagues who've covered IB IBS bloating and disorders of gut-brain interaction really uh, comprehensively. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Das. And your book looks fantastic, so I'm going to go out first to, to buy it and then I can give it to my patients. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you very much for joining. Um, this was stress related gut health issues uh, webinar. This will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, if you have any more questions, please do contact us. We will be more than happy to come back to you. And as always, have a good evening. <laughs>